On this week's episode of Hockey Inside Out, we discuss the midterm report card for the Montreal Canadiens. Does the panel give the Habs an A, B, C, D, or F minus? And also, for Kent Hughes and for the management team, do they go full tank mode with the injuries occurring for this team for Connor Bedard? And finally, the Mercurial P.K. Subban makes his return back to the Montreal Canadiens and the Bell Centre. We'll get the panel's thoughts on his return and also the bonus questions on this week's episode of Hockey Inside Out. And welcome in to a new edition of Hockey Inside Out. I'm your host, Mo Khan, alongside Stu Cowan, Andrew Berkshire, and Rick Green. Gents, let's dive into it. We'll put on our professor caps. I know all four of us probably had a great point average of like 1.6 during our academic uh, careers. Gents, let's give the grade at the midseason term for the Montreal Canadiens. What would you give them right now? And I'll give you some key stats here. They only suffered one seven-game losing streak at this point of the season here. They've had four game, four times a two-game winning streak. They had a one three-game winning streak. They have three players at 12-plus goals. You have four players at 20-plus points. They have win number 19 as of this week. Last year, win number 19 came on April 2nd. So, professors, what grade would you give the Montreal Canadiens? You, you know, even, even though they're four games below the 500 mark, I mean, I, I got to give them a passing grade. I mean, you look at this team when they were healthy and, you know, they had everybody in the lineup. They were tough to play against it. We talked about it a number of times where they were on a little bit of a roll saying, hey, these guys are are the real deal. They're making it it happen. But the reality uh, has set in. Injuries are part of the game. Um, We have to look at a a, a very positive note, uh, you know, that reflects their positive grade is the the defense, their their youth of their their hockey club. They've got a lot of uh, young guys that are showing great progression and improvement. And, uh, you know, this is uh, something that we can build on and look forward to in the future. And this was, uh, I think, kind of the uh, expectations that we saw going into this year that we're gonna see some bumps in the road. Uh, We saw a lot more positive than negative. And I think that uh, there's better things to come, uh, you know, in, in the future. Yeah, I think this is the perfect time to do this because not only are we just past the halfway point of the season, we just passed 82 games of Marty St. Louis as head coach of the Montreal Canadiens. And in that time, the Canadiens are 33, 42, and 7, a 73-point pace. And considering what they looked like before Marty came in, that's not bad. Is it a playoff team? Of course not. This is not a playoff team. They're not trying to be a playoff team. Well, maybe the players in the ice are, but uh, from a management perspective, they're not. I I think you have to kind of grade this team on a scale, right? Because you have to look at what they're trying to accomplish. And we know this is a development season where they're trying to get the best out of a few players who are going to be parts of the big parts of the team going forward. And on that, I'd have to give them at the very least like a B plus because you look at the development of Cole Caulfield, what Nick Suzuki has been able to do. And especially Kirby doc, who was a question mark coming into the season. When that trade happened, everyone was thinking, well, hopefully this guy can be a good player and, you know, Romanov's not that much of a loss. They have other young defensemen coming into the team, but he has been an absolute revelation and continues to be so, whether he's playing with Suzuki and Caulfield or whether he's centering his own line. It's truly special to see what he's developing into at just 21 years old. And then you've got the defensemen who continue to surprise, right? The, the young defensemen who continue to play above what we expected them to do uh, both in terms of where they're slotted in the lineup and the competition they're facing. It's been an impressive year for the kids. And I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. I'd give them a C plus. <clears throat> I would give them a B if it wasn't for the injuries probably, but injuries are part of the game. I mean, every team goes through them. So, uh, uh, you know, last year at the midway point, they had an eight twenty six and seven record this year at the midway point, there were 16, 22 and three. That's a 12 point improvement. Uh, despite all the injuries they've had. They played some real entertaining hockey earlier in the season, even when they were losing. Then they went to a little bit of a funk there where they were bad and boring, bringing back some bad memories from last season when Dominic Ducharme was uh, the head coach and Cole Caulfield couldn't score. But what's, what's impressed me is it's early into the second half of this season, but we've seen a team playing like they did at the start of the season. I mean, that game against Winnipeg, who would have thought they would beat the Jets? The Jets were 8-1 and one coming into this game. They were in first place in the Western Conference. The Canadians were missing half the team to injuries. You know, Evans, uh, Armia, and uh, Sapkowski announced the morning of the game that they're out. Uh, you know, Sean Monaghan on long-term injured reserve now, still missing Jake Allen. You figure that game was going to be a blowout. 
and they come in, they had one of their best performances of the season and they won four to one. And I think back speaking with Arbor Jack guy last week, you talked about how they had a meeting uh, at the end of the first half to talk about what their goals were for the second half of the season. And Arbor said that, you know, Marty St. Louis let us play in the first half. Like you let us play our game and be open and be free. And he says, now though, the second half, and this is the way he put it, Arbor Jack guy put it, says, we're playing for the crest and we're playing for the city of Montreal. And I think they were inspired by that P.K. Subban tribute. I know we're going to talk about that later in the show. I think it let the young players realize just how much this city will love you if you put it on the line every night when you're on the ice. And we've seen that. We especially saw that against the Jets. And the fight that Arbor Jack I had in the last minute of the game, he was going at Mark Shifley. And Shifley was terrified. And he went to the bench to get away from Jack I skated off the tough guy that he pretends that he, he is. And then Jack I ended up getting in a fight with another Jets player. And after the fight, when Jack I was skating to the bench, he was tapping the crest on his shirt. And I think that was the message that came from that meeting about going into the second half of the season. This team, the first half, it was all fun. Rookies playing. Marty wanted them to be open, wanted them to be free, wanted them to not be afraid of making mistakes. And now I think the timing with the Subban uh, showing up at the Bell Center, they're now playing with, I think, not that they weren't playing for pride before, but I think they're playing for a little bit more pride for the Crest and the city of Montreal. I think they've, they've, if they didn't know already, I think they see just how much this city loves this hockey team and wants them to do well. And we'll see if it can carry on in the second half, but a really impressive start to the second half of the season. Yeah, and I think we should also give extra credit to Marty St. Louis. I know it was a long time coming for a lot of these guys, but the patience that he's shown with a lot of players on this team to get them going has been remarkable. There's been healthy scratches for sure, alternating guys in and out of the lineup, but nobody really has faced like a consistent scratch streak where they're out like 10 games or something like that, or benched for half of a game kind of thing because they made a mistake. And now you've got Mike Hoffman scoring, Dodonov scoring, Armia was scoring before uh, he got injured. Jake Evans was playing his best hockey. He kept on allowing these players to have chances to produce. And eventually they started to reward him. Now, of course, you have more latitude to do that in a season where you're not competing for the playoffs. But I've really enjoyed watching uh, St. Louis' approach to the season. Well, Dadanov against Winnipeg, it was that was his best game by far. I mean, he I, people have knocked him. I think he's worked hard when he's played. It's just the game's gotten a little bit too quick for him at his age. But he, he was really good against Winnipeg. And Marty St. Louis, as you say, the patience he's had with guys and – Marty St. Louis' two biggest strengths, I think, of a, as a coach are his honesty and his communication skills. And I'm sure he's been honest with uh, Dadanov and the other players that he's made healthy scratches. And the other thing is, Marty said when he took this job, he's been in the shoes of every single player. He's been a guy who wasn't drafted. He's been a guy who was placed on waivers. He's been a fourth liner, third liner, second liner, first liner, league MVP. He's been an older guy at the end of his career, realizing, as he has said before, it's slipping away. I mean, Rick, you be able to relate. You, you realize it, it's coming to an end. And I think Dadnob is realizes he's at that point. And Marty St. Louis has been able to, despite, you know, making him a healthy scratch uh, several times this season, but communicating with him. And I think we, and after the game against Winnipeg, Marty said that Dadnob has been a real pro throughout all of this. He's worked hard in practice. He's worked hard at after practice when he's asked to stay after he's been a pro about it. And I think a lot of that has to do with just the way Marty St. Louis has been able to handle him. So gentlemen, I'll ask you this question here. We've been giving average grades, C's and whatnot here. But if there is one failing grade you would give to an aspect of the Canadians right now, is there any failing grade you see? You know what? They failed in this department in the last year or so under Marte St. Louis. Power play, F minus, as you said, to start off the show. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Power play. Power play, ouch. Ouch. Uh, it's uh, painful to watch. It's, it's actually yeah. painful to watch. I was watching the game last night. I tweeted out, like, they should start playing the Benny, uh, Benny Hill show theme song when the power plays on because it's become almost comical at just how bad it is. You know, the drop pack to, pass to Suzuki in his own zone every single time, struggle to get it in the zone, throw it around. It, it's, it's, become, it's become so bad that you almost have to laugh at it. And it really makes you wonder, you know, when you look at the skill set of those guys uh, and, you know, can make the difference five on five a lot of times, and it doesn't happen with their their you know their power play for whatever reason, whether it's just uh, second guessing or obviously execution. Um, you know, I, I I just I scratch my head. I'm sure uh, the guys in the uh, in the coaches' office are going, okay, what do we do next? And uh, you know, this has really been a sore spot for for a long time. And 
you know, unfortunately it's, uh, it's, it's haunting them. But uh, can I just uh, also kind of mention about, you know, I, I touched on injuries being part of, uh, uh, of every team's uh, problems. But if you look back uh, when the team was healthy, I, I mentioned Gooley, uh, I mentioned Matheson, and I see him, his contribution that he made uh, last night, Matheson, uh, allowing um, that part of the game to be improved with the mobility of those kind of guys that can skate the puck and join the rush and make things happen offensively. And you take those those type of ingredients out of your overall game and your game really starts to struggle. And, you know, unfortunately, those uh, those guys have uh, missed a lot of hockey and the team has missed them because they're a, a huge part. I, I think uh, when you see them out of the lineup and you see them in the lineup, there's a huge difference on their overall game. And the uh, bottom line is the win losses uh, come with uh, th- those kind of key guys out of your lineup. Well, the power play obviously isn't working with Burroughs in charge of it. And, um, you know, there might be other parts that the Canadians really like about him as a coach and other parts he brings in. And there's no salary cap for coaches. If you're bringing in, I mean, they're, they're building this analytics department and all this other stuff. It might be a, not a bad idea to bring in another coach whose only responsibility is the power play. So power play is so important, especially if, if, if and when the Canadians get to the playoffs. The power play is a huge, huge importance uh, regular season and even more so in, in the playoffs. So I think it, Kent Hughes and Gorton and those guys, it might be worth looking into the possibility of just bring in, bringing in another coach who's his only responsibility is a power play. As you said, Rick, there's talent on this team, but it's just the power play is just dreadful. But I, I think really you have to understand that Martin St. Louis oversees everything and he has, uh, he has his input on every detail yeah. of every part of the game. So, uh, Burroughs is, uh, is the, the, the front guy, if you will. Uh, but there's a lot of discussion that goes across, um, uh, goes across a different desk to see, okay, how do we make this thing better? Martin St. Louis is, uh, is a hands-on guy. He, he knows, uh, what power plays are all about. I'm sure there's a lot of discuss- discussions that go on what we should and shouldn't do. So it's uh, unfortunate that this type of, uh, problem area hasn't been cleared up, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that are involved in, uh, you know, what they should and what they shouldn't do. And uh, it's just, uh, it's too bad to see when they have that much skill set that they can't make things happen more more uh, on a positive note and get some goals. Yeah, the one thing they are missing is on that power play, though, is like, a, I think, a true quarterback of the power play. A true, like, you know, Jonathan Drouin can pass and Wideman can pass. They need a guy who can pass and shoot from that high point position. I think that's something, whether it's, through a trade or one of the prospects coming up through the draft, that's something they need to find is somebody who can be a real quarterback uh, for that power play. And, and Markov was probably the latest guy to, mm-hmm. to be a, a dominant yeah. guy that said, okay, you won't, don't want to uh, give me that shot. Uh, I'll make a, a nice pass through and, and, you know, make things happen. So yeah, the power play has been bad since Markov left pretty much. Pretty much. It's been a while. It's been a while, but I'll say this though, guys, C's get d- degrees. So by your final midterm report cards, those C's will get this team degrees and hopefully an A plus down the road. Well, as for the Montreal Canadiens, guys, they are now in a situation where they have a plethora of injuries as we speak. And we're about six weeks away from the NHL trade deadline. If you are Kent Hughes and management right now, do you go full tank mode for Connor Bedard? knowing that you're sort of in that race, but also not close enough yet towards that top pick in the draft lottery as we speak. And right now, if the draft was to be held today, they would be projected to be the seventh pick in the NHL draft come June. Yeah, I don't know if they'd go full tank mode. They'll move the players that they can move, but I don't expect every player that the Canadians fans want to be moved to move this year. Guys like Mike Hoffman, I think because he's kind of rebounded a little bit this year, but hasn't exactly lit things on fire. He has one more year in his contract. I don't know if anybody bites on that right now. The the cap space is so important in a flat cap world that it just becomes an issue of what do you have to take back in order to make this deal work? And is that going to put you in a bigger jam than Mike Hoffman's expiring contract the following year? Maybe. Maybe. So they can hold on to him. They can hold on to UL Armia and hopeful, be hopeful that next year is a better year for both of them where they can rebuild their value a little bit. 
I think Joel Edmondson will definitely get traded. His value is very high across the league. And uh, I would be surprised if they can't find something for Dodonov. I don't think it's going to be the big return that people assumed it would be when they first acquired him, but find a spot. I think he has played well enough lately. If he maintains that, they can find a spot. But uh, if they want to go full tank, they'd have to take a wrench to Sam Montembeau, and I don't think they're going to do that. (laughs) No, I don't think it'll be a full tank, but I think also they're not going to be rushing guys back who are injured. Uh, you know, take your time, get ready, make sure you're fine before you come back. Uh, you know, we've seen Sean Monahan put on long-term injury reserve, which is going to be interesting to see how that plays out leading up to the trade deadline. I don't think they're going to be able to trade him. You know, with all the injuries he's had, uh, that, does that maybe help the Canadians if they want to re-sign him moving forward? Or is he too much damaged goods that they just wash their hands and let him go? That's one of the interesting things to see. But, <clears throat> excuse me, they are gonna, Ken Hughes is going to move guys before the trade deadline. And the there'll be a weaker team as a result of that because they're going to be moving some veteran guys who play some key minutes and whatnot. But as you said, Andrew, it's not going to make trades just for the sake of making trades and getting rid of them. I mean, Kent Hughes is a smart guy. Their plan all along has been, as Marty St. Louis said, to get a little, get better every day. And getting better doesn't necessarily mean wins and losses. It means just, you know, improving the development of players, uh, playing with the, with the style of game Marty St. Louis wants to play, playing with the pride for the CH and playing for the city, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so I don't like the word tank mode, but um, they're going to be in the running for the Connor Bedard sweepstakes. There's no doubt about that because, I mean, as you mentioned, Sam Montebo, can he continue to play the way he's played? It's, he's been a real eye-opener these last five games since Jake Allen was hurt. He's played really, really, really well. Maybe he is their goalie of the future moving forward. He's definitely thrown his hat in the ring the way he's played recently. Uh, but, you know, they're going to be a worse team after the trade deadline than they are now. Uh, roster wise, and that's going to result in more losses. So they're definitely going to be in the Connor Bedard sweepstakes. But full tank mode, even if you finish dead last, it doesn't mean you're going to get Connor Bedard. You know, it's, it's uh, so they go. Yeah. They're not going to. They still they they have a good attitude in the room. And as I mentioned before, the second half was all about having keeping that attitude, and that attitude is hard to keep if you lose ten games in a row. But uh, they'll definitely be in the Connor Bedard sweepstakes. Yeah, and you you have to be careful, uh, you know, that you don't try and destroy something that uh, there's trying to build on, which is positivity and playing the right way. And uh, with a young group, you don't want them to get in a situation where you've got uh, uh, consistent poor play um, and just guys not responding to the pride of doing a good job. And um, I I don't foresee them, you know, uh, giving up. Um, you know, trying to uh, tank, as they say. I think that they're going to continue to try and improve with uh, what they have. A few uh, movement uh, movements on their personnel is probably in the works. But, you know, one of the positives is uh, with the injuries that they do have, they're giving some of these young guys opportunity to log a few more minutes and get a real good reading on, you know, where these guys stand in the future by putting them in different situations and allowing them to show what they can show. So, um, you know, let's, uh, let, let's see how this, uh, this plays out in the last uh, stretch here. But I think that uh, uh, the pride of what they have in their dressing room is one of let's show up, let's compete every night, let's make it entertaining. And we'll see what, uh, you know, way things add up at the end of the year. Yeah. And we shouldn't discount the fact that Canadians have currently two shots Mm -hmm. at Connor Bedard, right? They're probably going to move down the standings a little bit. I, I don't know if they can go further down than 27th spot. I assume that Vancouver will pass them just based on games played. And uh, I think Vancouver is just a little bit better of a team, but uh, San Jose has good underlying numbers, but the gap is pretty large now at uh, six points. So still like, it's a pretty good shot at the first overall pick or moving up a little bit there. And, you've also got Florida's pick and Florida is getting closer to a playoff spot with their play of late, but they're still a far ways away and they've played a lot more games than the teams around them. So don't be surprised if Florida ends up in the bottom 10 as well. And the Canadians get two shots. And at one point in recent weeks, the Canadians actually had the third best odds to win the lottery entirely between those two picks, which I know that's not quite how it works, but that's, that's pretty decent overall. And, the other thing to be aware of with the whole Connor Bedard sweepstakes is yes, Connor Bedard is by far the best player in this draft. However, there's this guy in Russia named Matt Vemichkov, who is very clearly the second most talented player in this draft, who is going to fall because of the uncertainty of his situation in Russia. 
And if the Canadians end up with like the fifth pick and end up with a guy like Mitchkov, I don't think many people are going to be upset. I mean, Anaheim, Chicago, and Columbus are terrible. I mean, they're going to be the best chance of getting the uh, Bedard. But can you imagine if the Canadians, with that Florida draft pick, end up with Connor Bedard, and they basically got Connor Bedard for Ben Sherratt? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that would be, you know, Ken Hughes has to be GM of the decade just for that move alone. If he was able to spin Ben Sherratt for Connor Bedard, what a move that is. Well, still, they might rename Randy Levesque Ken Hughes uh, Boulevard at that point yeah, here. That would be... <laughs> uh, and Florida didn't even keep Sherrod after they made the trade. You know, he left, for, him, he left right. for Detroit. So, man, oh, man, that uh, that trade, boy, that's one of those ones that could be franchise-altering for two teams, both for Florida and for the Canadians. Well, yeah, uh, it, Sam Pollock would come back to life to give him a <laughs> standing ovation because that puts, like, yeah. the Lafleur deal, yeah. you know, getting that Lafleur pick in yeah. a whole other – echelon in history, right? No. Knocks it down a peg. No. So, I want to ask you guys this question, though. Last summer, Ken Hughes was aggressive on draft day. We saw what he did. With Let's say, hypothetically, the Habs end up with, I don't know, the fourth pick, and that fourth pick ends up being the tenth pick of the draft. Bradar's not in play, but Mishkov is there at number two. Do you see Ken Hughes being aggressive to maybe package those two picks and move up the board to get his guy at number two, if not number three? Wouldn't surprise me. No, nothing with Ken Hughes would surprise me really at this point. I mean, it's uh, or if they have a lower pick, does he do what he did last year and and traded for a Kirby Doc type guy, a twenty one year old guy who was a high pick earlier and already has a, some NHL experience and maybe just needs to change the scenery. Listen, listen to the offers. That's yep. what he does well, and he's got a real good feel for you know uh, picking and choosing, and it's so far so good. So I, I'm quite sure he's uh, his phone will be busy and. Uh, He's, uh, he's made a lot of good uh, decisions. Yeah, well, I mean, this week's going to mark the one-year anniversary of Ken Hughes becoming GM. And after the Winnipeg game, I asked Marty St. Louis what he appreciated most about him as a GM. He said, just the fact that he worked so hard. And I asked Mike Matheson, who had uh, Hughes was his agent since the time he was like 15 years old. And he said the same thing. He said he just he works all the time. He's, he's always on the phone. He's always working. I remember there was a practice in St. Louis this year. Uh, and the Blues practice rink is this little suburban rink. And for an hour and a half, I watched Kent Hughes walk around the lobby on his phone for an hour and a half straight. I mean, I imagine maybe part of it was talking with his wife, but I'm sure he didn't talk with his wife for an hour and a half. So he was, uh, you know, he's always he's always got something going. I, I hope he has a good uh, phone plan for himself. But yeah. He's talked for 90 minutes straight on the phone with whoever he was conversing with. Well, we'll find out from the Montreal Canadiens. Maybe they do package those picks and get aggressive to get themselves a top-end pick. We'll find out. But for now... We don't know what the plan is for the next six weeks. Maybe these guys get dealt today, tomorrow, or by March 4th. Who knows what they have planned coming up ahead. Pernell Carl Subban, the most mercurial athlete in Montreal sports in the last decade plus or so. He was in town last week at the Bell Center where they gave him a tribute. Gentlemen, your takeaways from that event, it felt the passion, the raw emotion of the fan base, given that love affair that they had with P.K. Subban being rekindled like it was last week. I think it just highlighted the fact, you know, fans can argue over who won this trade from a hockey standpoint. From a PR standpoint, it was a disaster for the Canadians. I mean, we just saw the love that fans still have for P.K. Subban almost seven years after the trade. Uh, he was special. I mean, P.K. was a personality, and unfortunately, that personality rubbed some people the wrong way, including Mark Bergevin and Michel Terrier and some of his teammates. I mean, that triple low five at the end of the ceremony might go down as the highlight of the season for the Canadians. I mean, that was like, as I wrote in the column, that was like three slaps at Michel Therrien and Marc Bergevin. Um, you know, from a hockey standpoint with that trade, I think it was basically a write-off, especially they got ties, especially since the Canadians were able to dump the last four years of Shea Weber's contract. I mean, the Predators didn't trade Shea Weber. They traded his ridiculous contract. They knew it would be a disaster near the end. And if he hadn't, you know, basically retired without officially retiring by injuries. It would have been a disaster for the Canadians hanging on to the last four years of that contract. But P.K. Subban loved everything about being a Montreal Canadian. He loved the city. He loved the fans. He loved the spotlight. He loved talking to the media. He loved everything. Shea Weber hated everything about playing in Montreal, except actually being on the ice and in the room with his teammates. He hated the spotlight. He hated the media. He hated talking about himself. There, I mean, you can't get two more different personalities than Shea Weber and, and P.K. Subban. They're total opposite ends of the spectrum and 
PK fans loved PK. He was, I mean, I've spoken with some younger Canadians fans and like he was their guy, right? I mean, you guys are younger than me. You really, like he was the guy for them. He was sort of the Gila Fleur to that generation of hockey fans who don't remember Gila Fleur. So I think it just highlighted, as I said, from a PR standpoint, I think it was a disastrous trade for the Canes. I think the whole night was a PR move more than anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, more the, and, and they brought him back. But having said that, kudos to Jeff Molson for bringing PK back. Um, that didn't end well here, obviously. Him and Bergeron didn't see eye to eye. You go back to the contract. I mean, PK, on one of the podcasts he did, he said he wanted to be a Canadian for life. And, you know, when they, they took him to arbitration, it got ugly, and they went back and forth. And then Bergeron didn't want to give him the contract he eventually gave him. Jeff Molson had to step in and give it to him. Um, anyway, it was just nice to see PK back at the Bell Centre. And fans, I mean, some fans don't like him, but the majority of Montreal fans love PK Subban. And personally, I, I was a little surprised that they did that, but not taking away from the fact that they recognize him as a, a generous guy that, you know, has, has done great things for the Montreal uh, Children's Hospital. You can't take that away from him. Uh, a guy that, you know, in watching him play, exciting player, uh, I know there would be a number of times if I was behind the bench watching some of the things go on that he was doing, I would be, uh, I'd have to hold back uh, on some, some of my comments on, on, you know, the way he did things, but, you know, disregarding that, um, you know, he, he was liked, he was entertaining. Uh, unfortunately, uh, his personality, um, didn't mix into the, the mindset of the Montreal Canadiens organization. So he was moved along and, you know, if you look at the overall uh, performance from his points, uh, goals and assists, and you draw a comparison to, say, a Markov, um, you know, Markov to me uh, is, is, was the type of player that deserves uh, recognition. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, we haven't heard too much uh, about his name being mentioned because he did uh, he, he did do, double up the points, goals, and, and assists compared to Subban. But without taking away from uh, PK, uh, a great uh, a great player that loved to play for the Montreal Canadiens, did it each and every night. Hats off to him that they recognize him for uh, a job well done when he was here and, uh, and the type of personality that he is in giving back to community. So um, a, a very nice uh, gesture on the part of of a classy Montreal Canadiens organization. Yeah, we should say that the Canadiens did mention that they were wanted to do the same thing for Andre Markov, and I believe the original plan was to have him and Subban together to be honored, but uh, Markov has commitments in Russia right now. He's an assistant coach for a KHL team, so he couldn't make it over. So they're actively trying to figure out something to honor Markov, but I think the Canadiens have hit on something really smart here in that you can honor former players without retiring their jersey. And yeah, it's 100% PR, but that PR can have ripple effects throughout your organization. And as Stu mentioned earlier in the show, PK coming back absolutely fired up this this hockey team. Now, I think they were started to play better in the 4-1 loss to the New York Rangers a couple weeks ago, but there's no denying how that team came out after his speech against Nashville that they were a different team. They were fired up. Yuri Slavkovsky memorized part of P.K. Subban's speech and repeated it to the media after the game. You know, like These guys saw what the crowd gave to P.K. Subban and were like, I want that. You, you know, Jack I in the other game uh, pulling up the sweater, showing the logo off. That's a P.K. Subban move. He did that against the Ottawa Senators early in his career, I believe after scoring an overtime goal. Uh, you know, he got Galchenyuk doing it back in that era. P.K. Subban was a very important player to this organization, not just in terms of, of goals and points, but in fully embracing what it means to be a Montreal Canadian in the modern era and fully embracing what it means to be a Montrealer. You know, he was, he was such a big person in the community. And you see the stories told about how he was, I forget which player he was driving. I think it was David D'Arnais. They were driving away from practice and he like got D'Arnais to pull over onto the side of the road because he'd saw somebody who was just wearing a PK Subban jersey and he ran out of the car in the winter to sign their jersey. And David Darren is like, what the heck are we doing? Pulling over onto the side of the road. We're trying to go home. And that's just the guy PK one was he cares about the fans. And I think that using his moment 
to raise up a kid, uh, Mila, who he brought out, who needed to be lifted up a little bit. That's just, it speaks to who he is. And I think that's part of why people love P.K. Subban so much. It's on the ice, but it's also off the ice. And I, I hope that, that the young players in the team continue to get inspiration from that. And I hope the Canadians continue to honor former players who maybe aren't quite there with the jersey retirement thing. We tossed around the idea of Markov having a, his jersey retired at some point early in the season on this show. And I think he's he's there. Like He, he deserves it. He has the accolades. But Markov has the the compile stats like he, he was here for a long time but i would argue that in pk suban's tenure with the montreal Canadiens, he was a bigger impact on the organization than andre markov was and that's why he's deserving of moments like that especially when you think of the playoffs well, there's not- no player in montreal Canadiens in, like in my lifetime since patrick waugh that was a bigger playoff player than P.K. Subban. Yeah, the bigger the game, the better P.K. played. I mean, that's the reality. And you talk about that story with uh, Darren and getting out. People say P.K. did everything in front of the camera. He did a lot of stuff away from the camera. That's what I've seen a lot of it. That's an, one example. I remember the time he got out and he was playing street hockey with some kids in Westmount or something. That got on social media, not by him. It was the parents who had videotaped it and started putting it out. Um, I remember we the Hockey Inside Out Summit one year, there was a young boy from Saskatchewan who had had meningitis and almost died in the HIO community the great community that it is got together and raised money to bring him and his dad to a game at the Bell Center. I wrote a column about it. And the next morning when the columns in the paper, I got a phone call from some guy saying, um, how do I get uh, PK Subban to meet this kid? I need, we need to make this happen. And I was like, well, you know, you go through the Canadians and you know, it's, they get a lot of requests. I can't guarantee anything. He said, no, 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 no. I'm a close friend of PK. PK saw the story. He wants to meet this kid. So arrangements were made through his friend. And after the game, the kid met PK, no cameras, nothing around. And I still remember the father sobbing with his son hugging PK. And PK was spent 10 minutes with the kid. And you now I've seen PK at the children's hospital. He lights up every room he walks into. He just has that personality. Uh, you know, he brought Mila out for that game That was, and got the chant for her. That was fantastic. I cringe when people criticize PK for making his association with the children's hospital so public because the children's hospital loves that he does that. They wish more athletes would do that because every time he publicizes it, they're probably going to get more donations. And I cringe. People criticize him for being so public about that. Meanwhile, you got Wayne Gretzky and Connor McDavid and Austin Matthews doing ads for gambling websites, promoting that like like it's apples. And, you know what I mean? But PK gets criticized for his public uh, uh, promotion of uh, the Children's Hospital. I'm with Markov. PK said if he had more time to speak in the pregame ceremony, he would have spoken about Markov. When we spoke with PK during the first intermission, he went on and on about just how important Markov was to him and his career, how much he helped them, how they came from totally different backgrounds, a Russian kid and, and, and the black kid from Toronto, but they got together and PK said he used to sit and eat lunch every day at the Russian table to try and learn some words in Russian just to be able to speak with Markov. And uh, you probably learn more of the swear words in Russian than anything else. Because that's <laughs> what happens when hockey players learn a second language. But again, it was it, to me, it was just nice to see PK back at the at the Bell Center, and he lights up the building the same way he would light up a room at the Children's Hospital. So, guys, quickly here, uh, look, I spent a lot of time in the inner cities of Montreal and in the Black community, and when PK was here, they all became Habs fans. They connected with PK Subban. They said when he left. We kind of had that disconnect. Mm-hmm. If you're the Montreal Canadiens, do you bring back Subban as a team ambassador to kind of reconnect with the ethnic communities of the city and province of Quebec to kind of rekindle that love affair that they all had when PK was here? It's a no-brainer mm-hmm. to, to do it, but he has commitments at ESPN, right? So I, I feel like most of the ambassadors live in Montreal. So maybe at some point in his career, if he wants to come back and work for the organization in some capacity, that can be an option, but as long as he's going to be on TV in the States, it, it seems like a relative impossibility to, for him to be a full-time ambassador. I think he's busy with his other gigs, uh, TV wise, uh, like Andrew says, and uh, you know, they do have res- representation with uh, ambassadors uh, so far. Um, you know, I don't, I don't foresee him uh, uh, making that move to say, even if the opportunity was given, whether he would jump on that, that chance. Cause he's, he's a pretty busy guy. Well, for the Montreal Canadiens, uh, it was a hallmark moment for them to honor P.K. Subban that it was last week. Don't forget, 
Send us your questions and comments, whether it's PK Suen or something else. I will converse about that in a future episode. And check out on the YouTube page for Hockey Inside Out. And for the newsletter, go on by to the MontrealGazette.com slash newsletters for the latest news on the Montreal Canadiens in and around the NHL. Full episodes and bonus content and on my Hockey Inside Out. And check it out. On behalf of Stu, Rick, and Andrew, wish you a great week. We'll speak to you soon. Bye for now. Thank you.